So we're going to start with Toon, our Dutch colleague in yeah. the Netherlands from Netherlands. So we're going to talk about integration decision making process in flood risk analysis. So yeah. You're not going to get any bonus, but <laughs> we time. can manage that 10 minutes. I know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for the invite to the organizers. It's very nice to, to be here. Very interesting talk so far. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about work that I did during my PhD, mostly with the Finnish uh, last year, about integrating a phase simulator in flood risk analysis. And I used mostly uh, agent based modeling approaches to uh, get this done. Uh, so my name is Stone. I mostly did this with my supervisors, Jeroen Arendt and Wouter Botsen. But I also want to acknowledge some other colleagues, Hans de Moel, Von Brutti and Klaas de Ruij, who is also in the room. And my uh, setting of work is the Institute for Environmental Studies. And the program is run with the Enhance European Project and the Dutch Organization for Scientific Research. So, of course, in the, we hear in the news eh, about all this increasing increasing disaster risk and uh, due to either climate change, but as most of you know, also due to socioeconomic development. Um, and uh, it seems to get worse and worse. And of course, we want to give some sort of projection uh, towards the future of what we want to do with this, uh, risk, with this, uh, with this risk. Um, so we want to know how the future turns out and how risk will be uh, developing uh, towards the future. So we can base our adaptation strategies um, on this uh, on this expectation of risk. So from our field, and I think we're here from from different uh, from different fields, also social fields, but also the more uh, more data fields. Um, we define flood risk and by uh, s uh, several components. For those who, who don't know this, use the setting. We have the exposure and the vulnerability. So the set the the assets exposed in a certain area. Uh, where, where there's flood risk, um, but also how well we are equipped to deal with this flooding. So, for instance, we can think of houses that are uh, that are adapted in such a way that they can handle a little bit more flooding. For instance, tile floors. If you have tile floors on uh, in your house, there will be less damage than there uh, than there would have been otherwise. Of course, there is some protection usually offered by the governments. In the Netherlands, we have a lot of protection. Yeah, we have dikes. Uh, throughout the Netherlands, half of our country is below uh, below sea level, so we actually need them. And then we have the hazard hazard itself, and we all have this data uh, in, in gridded data, and then we can get some sort of assessment of the flood risk. And uh, to put a number on it, we usually express this in uh, in expected annual damage. So we get a, a number of euro per year um, where there's uh, how much flood risk there is. If we use this system, and it has been done a lot by a lot of colleagues, uh, we get over time, we get a certain risk, and that's the year over year. We have some climate change, some socioeconomic development, and we can get a calculated risk. This is something that, for instance, the IPCC uh, uses to say, okay, this is how the future will be, uh, will be developing. And this is also something we can base, for instance, cost-benefit analysis on, okay, we see that risk is going to be this high, our dike is uh, cost this much, so we can implement this, uh, this dike structure because it, from an economic perspective, it's actually beneficial to do so. But over the years, what, uh, what we of course realize is that um, this flood risk is, while in many of these studies it's, it's seen as a static, uh, static scenario with static hazard uh, projections, with static protection uh, uh, projections, and with the exposure and uh, socioeconomic data um, uh, as a fixed scenario, um, actually this is not the case in real life. Of course, we know that governments will respond to flooding. We saw that in the Netherlands after the disaster in 1953. That is when our Delta program really picked up. We see it in many other countries. If a hazard happens, then the government will do something. So the occurrence of a hazard really determines the, uh, the actions of the government. Now in the Netherlands, we are proactive. Uh, we actually, before the hazard occurs, we think ahead. But many countries are still in this reactive state. The same is for households. Households will also, although not often, uh, respond to a flooding by actually preparing themselves better. For instance, in Germany, there were studies that after a flood, you saw an increase in people putting measures in place to, to protect their houses. And this is, of course, also influenced by uh, different components. So a flood event, which is one of the biggest determinants of whether or not governments or households will adapt. 
but also the information that is available will play a role in, in what people will do. Their social network, if your neighbor protects their house against the flood, you might be more inclined to protect yourself as well. Um, and maybe some financial incentives. So uh, for instance, an insurance company, if you have a flood insurance, can stimulate you to protect your house by, um, uh, by offering an incentive to do so. And this has actually, uh, for especially in these large scale uh, risk analysis, has not been integrated into this flood risk um, analysis. And this is something I've uh, made the first steps in doing in my, uh, in my thesis. For this, I used agent-based models, and luckily we, we already had some presenters uh, uh, talking about agent-based models. Some of you are familiar, and after this morning are more familiar. But basically, you model the actions and interactions of individual agents, which can be anything, but in my case, it were mostly governments and households, uh, and the effect thereof on the system, which in my case was of interest of flood risk. So we see uh, households with a character, character type B, they make a choice between action one and two, for instance, protection and no protection. Um, but we have another household which makes another choice. We have the social network in between, and we have a government offering overall protection. And this is the, the basic of, of the model that I applied. So I not only used the standard flood risk framework, but I integrated this with the, um, with the decisions of governments and households. So, we did this on a, on a large scale. This is something I want to talk about first. I, we did this uh, in the most recent paper on a large scale for the European Union um, because we wanted to see, okay, how do these large scale IPCC uh, projections change if we include different types of behaviors of governments and households and also a little bit of insurance companies. So what we did, we have for the whole of Europe, we have uh, agents for, uh, for the EU um, based on a certain resolution level. Um, and we have them making decisions, but we also have different behavior types. And of course, ideally, uh, people behave rational, they have perfect information about the flood risk, uh, and they make their decision based on an on economic choice. But we know, of course, from reality that this is not the case. Households are, uh, they have imperfect information, they often respond only after a flood. So if we want to assess risk, we also want to see what is the difference between the perfect world and world we actually have. So in the model, I use expected utility theory. It's an economic theory, but I adapted it to reflect both the rational choice, but also the irrational choice. What if people perceive the probability, uh, P, the probability of an event differently than reality? And the decisions they could make were dry proofing uh, for existing buildings because of the cost efficient, elevating for new buildings. They could take out insurance uh, or they can do nothing. So that's one agent, which we have for the whole of Europe, for all the countries. Then we have the governments in the EU. They make decisions per region. We choose NUTS 3 region, which is like a uh, you know, municipality level or a little bit bigger. Um, and different behavior types, again, eh, stylized of the real world. We have a proactive scenario, uh, which where governments make decisions based on what we do in the Netherlands. In six-year cycles, we check, okay, is this still the optimal choice or do we need to improve? or reactive and they only uh, act after a flood. And this decision is based on a cost-benefit analysis, just that the benefit, the yearly cost, the benefit is the risk reduction that a measure could, could make, the yearly cost and the discount rate for the protection. And the decision for the government was simple, they could just raise protection standards by increasing dikes or do nothing. Just to show you the framework that it's in, uh, quickly, uh, and stylized, uh, we'll put it on, but we used all the Standard, like this is the standard risk assessment framework where we use hazard maps, we use land use maps, we use socioeconomic maps. So that's just uh, all, the, all the standard data in there, which is usually static. We transformed it to a yearly values so that we could come to this important section where households and agents, uh, the, the government agents, actually make decisions in yearly time steps to either do something or don't do something. And then the output was a risk, which is euro per year value, and the households that are protected and the government that, are, that offers protection. So this is a stylized graph of a paper we just uh, published, um, and it shows the expected damage per year for households in the EU. So this is the flood risk, starting from 2010 to 2018. Um, and this is how we usually have the projection in the uh, IPCC reports. 
it's a static behavior, so we don't have any behavioral rules in there. We just have the climate change scenarios and the conclusion of that. Then if we look at the upper bound, the most realistic, let's say, from, from you, like if people are making imperfect choices, if they are reactive, we see actually that this projection of risk is quite different than the, than the static one. But on the other hand, if we see a proactive, so we have a government, all governments in the EU make decisions in six-year cycles, but also households make rational choices, we see that the, uh, that the risk level remains the same. And actually within this, this is for the RTP 8.5 climate scenario, which is the upper climate scenario, we see that if adaptation is proactive from both the government side and the household side, we see that the risk level is actually uh, remains almost the same, even though climate is, is changing a lot. So um, within this, this study, the, um, the thing that we contributed with this, with this result is that we had a first look at, okay, what if we don't assume this, this static scenario with her, which is usually taken, but what if we, uh, what if we take um, uh, behavior in it, we give a little bit of a better insight of what happens to risk. So what if, the, what if we could do it? But also, if we take this upper and lower bound of reactive and proactive, what is the difference between the two, which gives us a number of how much we can achieve by stimulating actually a more uh, desired behavior. And we can put a number on it, which gives some number on uh, policy that we, can, uh, that we can implement to, to improve this. And then finally, we can say something about the remaining risk, which can, for instance, be, this number can for instance be used by funds to, um, to actually uh, cover this remaining section of risk, insurance, or the European solidarity. And I think I have a little bit of more time because what we this is from a from a new study that we use the same model for, which I thought very interesting. This was on the general risk, but of course we also have to think about some negative effects of government protection. And one of these uh, processes that is maybe known by some is called the levy effect. If governments raise the protection standard, then people are also not inclined to protect themselves, uh, and they will maybe move into the area. So this will actually increase the impact of a very unlikely. And some results, but I think, nah, this is just let's skip the results. But we have this for the European, we have the results. So I think it's best for me to conclude here. I have some more slides, but I think it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, so just the main contribution here that I, that I ended with uh, and some papers which, which is based on for, uh, for reference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stu. It's a three minutes already. Okay, well, I have two more slides. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, please. So, you mentioned in your previous slide about the um, levy effect, but in your model, did you consider that because this is very important? So, for example, if the government protection uh, is taken place, your model shows that the risk is uh, reducing, but in, yeah. in reality, this might not be happening because of yeah. this levy effect. But did you consider yeah. in your agent this model? Yeah, so this, the, the first thing that I showed was, was the first paper on the model, which we did not consider this levy effect. In this paper, which is still to be published, uh, we checked whether the risk would change a lot uh, due to this levy effect. Uh, but it does not do so much because it only affects the extreme uh, values. Um, so let's say if you have a 1 in 100 year event, uh, this will have a little bit more impact. But for the risk, which is an integral under all probabilities, it does not change the risk as much, but it does change the impact of an extreme event a lot. But it doesn't sense because of the vulnerability is uh, reduced, or uh, so the, the if it, so for risk it doesn't make that much difference because the government is still offering protection, which is which is reducing a lot of the risk. But for the uh, event that overtops the the dive, um, then there will be more impact because more people moved in for protection. Thank you. Yeah. You show the slide with the uh, outcomes of your of your uh, simulation analysis with the, the, the upper lower bound. This one? Uh, no, one back. Yes, this one. This one. Yeah. Um, seems quite linear. Yeah. To me. Can Good you question. Maybe comment on yeah. that. Yeah. Where you expected that at the beginning of your yeah. analysis? Uh, I expected it because this is the aggregated result for the whole of Europe. Uh, if and it's for 
multiple runs because with agent based models you always want to do an X amount of runs. So this is, uh, if you look at the single run, this proactive would go a little bit like this because it depicts that for a single region. Uh, and this one might go yeah, everywhere for a single region, but this is for all regions in Europe, uh, aggregated over many simulations, many runs. So that's why you see static lines here. But indeed, the underlying result, good question, is much more erratic. Yeah, Andres. <coughs> Maybe I, I missed the point, but why is the reactance frequency higher in the cycling mist than the septic? I do not know. Um, yeah, that's uh, again a good with the baseline uh, scenario is keeping the protection standards uh, similar. So we took, we took what was the most recent in scientific literature about uh, expecting flood risk. And with this, let's say, if a, in a special scenario, if a government has a protection standard of one in 100 years, this will remain the same. So in sort of a way, it's, it's, it's adaptation, um, but it's a static, static process. And uh, this one is governments yeah, only react in, uh, to flooding. So protection standard might be lower because flood risk because the flood volume increases. We also did a scenario where the dikes remain the same, so that would be actually the very static scenario, and that's, that line goes higher than the reactor scenario. Yeah? Yeah, um, I think in the back. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, do you think about the system kind of uh, um, possession of the system, or CPU, um, yeah. and do you actually impress the CPU as a threshold between the two, so at one point, even proactive measures, one one be able to um, mitigate this and yeah, we so we did we did do this also for the ICP two point six to get a lower bound of the of the assessment in the SSP one. Um, and what we did see so there there's um, this is from the RCP eight point five, and this one is actually lower than the RCP two some of the RCP two point five. So the one thing that we did see was, okay, if we take this behavior into account, the spread is bigger than uh, the spread would have been from the climate scenario. So this poses also a question, do we want to keep focusing very much on this uh, climate scenarios, or do we want to focus more on adaptation scenarios? Because this might be, as we know from reality, adaptation changes risk a lot. So it's a good question. Maybe the last one with Liam. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, I think my Oh, yeah, forget it. It is close, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Just wondering, I support the word never a flood event at EU scale. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but how you yeah. combine so many yeah. flood events in one model? In yeah, one so it's, it's, that's why I have many, many runs. I use the supercomputer cluster to get, uh, to get the runs because flood happens stochastically in regions in yeah. Europe according to the probability level. Um, so actually, I needed all those runs to get this probabilistic flood events in there. But then you combine many uh, runs. And now all these runs is the egg. This is this is from from many many runs together. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. Um. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> One minute, please. Okay. This very interesting diagram. Is the uh. This morning we heard that we are following the cycle with the Dutch strategies. And if I assume if any government follows a proactive risk reduction strategy, why is risk not decreased? Risk is decreased. You mean this one? Yes. Be because the it could, should decrease. No, because the, the, the baseline goes up. So it reduces compared to the baseline. If, if risk develops like this. This is if I would if I would detrend this for the for the for the baseline increase of risk, then of course the this would go down. So they just reduced compared to what it would have been if the government had done this. Uh, okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah. That was a very interactive session. Mm -hmm. and nice <laughs> yeah, that's nice. <laughs> thanks. So so maybe another final clap for Tom. It was very interesting.